Hey guys, how's it going? For those of you who don't know who I am, uh, because I know maybe some of you are showing up in this live stream and you've never seen me before, or you don't know what I do. <laughs> My name is Thomas Brush and I've been you know, making, making indie games as a full-time job for seven, I think it's six or seven years. I've been doing making games for like half of my life, 15 years, um, but been doing it full-time, like paying for my family's bills, right? My wife, my kids, my dog, my mortgage, through indie games. And I continue to make indie games. I'm working on an indie game right now, which is much bigger than my previous two. Um, but I made a game called Never Song, a game called Pinstripe, and the current game I'm working on is Twisted Tower. And it's a bigger, more expensive game um, than I'm used to, but we're having a blast. So we're gonna jump inside of this little webinar here, and I just wanna talk to you guys about how you can start a game in a game studio in one year. Now, I'm super duper nervous about this webinar. I, I gotta tell you, like I'm more nervous than usual um, my heart's beating a little bit faster and kind of shaking because I, I don't want to overpromise anything. And I get really nervous. Like the older I get, I get more and more nervous about leading people down the wrong path. Um, so starting a game studio in one year, this is not for everybody. I would argue that the minority of you are going to be able to achieve this. A small few. Does that mean you can't do it at all? No, it means that for some of you, it might take two years. Some of you, it might take four years. Right, it really depends on your level of talent, your dedication, um, and your willingness to learn and listen and, and be led. Um, but if I were to try my best, maybe talk to my older self, because it took me four years, really it took me probably five to get into a position of doing this full time. If I were to talk to my older self and say, Thomas, here's what you need to do to start a game studio in a year, um, this is what we would do, okay? Now, by the way, just letting you know, if you wanna support the channel and support the development of our next game, which is called Twisted Tower, it's a much more expensive game. So yes, I could fund my salary with all of my previous games, and that's what I usually do, but the, this game is much bigger. So, uh, you know, an online course and some resources, we'll talk about this, by the way, if you wanna do this for yourself, um, but this is one of my other ways that we fund the studio and my team. This is called Full-Time Game Dev. Um, I have over 3,500 students worldwide who love the program. To celebrate New Year's, it's 50% off right now and you're also gonna get my 2D art program totally free. Um, this program is dedicated to, well, helping you start a full-time game dev studio. It's massive, it goes into everything we're about to talk about, but it's super duper deep and granular. Everything I've learned in the last decade of making indie games. And it actually does work, right? I've got students who have reached out, including Lord Grimm, who said, I just became a full-time indie game developer. And that means that he's found the funding. He's secured funding using my methods to go full-time. And that also includes Chris. Chris raised over $150,000. Where is Chris? Chris, 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 where are you, buddy? He raised over 150,000. It says 100,000 here, but it continued after I posted this, over $150,000 on Kickstarter using my methods. So it's a pretty awesome course. Click below to get 50% off. There's only 100 seats available, 14 days left. Also get 2D Art Pro. So anyway, that aside, let's jump inside of the webinar, okay? Start a game studio in one year. Again, can't promise anything. I just wanna heart, like really focus on that. <laughs> I can't promise anything. Oh, and yeah, if you're a student, let us know in the chat um, what you think about the program. Okay, so here are the four steps that over a year, and actually only three of them are over a year. The last one is actually just what you would do after that first year, okay? Again, this isn't a promise, and it's not me saying everybody, this is for everybody. I'm saying if you really wanted to condense it down to one year, here's what I would do, okay? And you're gonna be surprised by the end of this webinar how all of these things are probably not you, what you would think, okay? Um, so let's just, talk really quick, briefly, about these four steps. The first one is just learning your tools, okay? And we're gonna talk about our 2D tools and our 3D tools, just do a quick, brief overview. And I would love you guys in the chat to help each other out and give each other information about the tools that you love, because I'm not gonna tell you every tool, I'm just gonna tell you the ones I love. Then we're gonna talk about releasing two crappy games. This is kind of like the, when, when people say like, when you go to the gym, you should do you know, a, a practice rep right? Or, or you should do some like warm-up sets. Um, 
it's kind of like that where you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to do that. Or stretching, ah, I don't really want to do that. But then you find out that it's like the most important part. Releasing two crappy games is insanely important. And then funding your dream game is the next step, okay? And that's actually gonna happen six months into this process, okay? Um, you're gonna start the funding process. It's gonna, it, I know it sounds weird, just hang tight and it'll all make sense. And then finally, we're gonna talk about other funding options. What I just mentioned, my online course, that's a funding option, okay? Where you can build training materials, build an audience, okay? Now, I will be completely honest with you guys, okay? It, this is super important for me to say. The first like five years of me running my studio, it was just purely just game sales. <clears throat> and that was what I wanted to do, right? And then I started this channel and I started selling online programs. And that is a huge, huge portion of funding right now, okay? So we had a ton of, ton of funding op opportunities for the games themselves. And then this channel blew up and it's now also online training material. And so half of me is like, I don't wanna tell people that, but another half of me is like, I would love to tell you guys about that because it's a great opportunity for you as well. So we're gonna talk about that, all these funding opportunities, selling assets, you know, starting a YouTube channel, Patreon, sponsorships, selling games to Apple, which I've done, selling games on Switch and Xbox, PlayStation, Steam, which I've done, Kickstarter, I've done, publishers, I've done, <laughs> like I've, I've done, I can't, I can't think of one funding opportunity I haven't done because I've done them all. Um, so we're gonna talk about that, okay? All these funding opportunities. Okay, so let's, let's jump right in to how long each one is gonna take. Okay, again, we're condensing this down. If we had to distill it down into a really, really sharp pointed strategy, if I had like D-Day and we're like, let's do this, we've gotta do this, we've got one year to do it, this is how long I think it's gonna take, okay? Three months of learning tools, the basics, right? You're gonna pick one. You're not gonna pick 2D and 3D tools. You're gonna say, which one, which kind of game do I wanna make? 2D or 3D games? Three months of releasing two crappy games, okay? And that means learning those tools and getting better at those tools while you release these two crappy games. These two crappy games need to be only one, one dimension, 2D or 3D. You need to pick one, okay? Then, Finally, after you release those crappy games and everybody hates them and you get bad reviews, you have a thicker skin, you have skill, you know how it feels, okay? And then you dedicate the next six months to building out a pitch deck, a prototype, a trailer to get funding. And by funding, I mean six figures in funding for your dream game. It sounds like a pipe dream, doesn't it? But I've done it multiple times, I'm doing it again, okay? This is my third game doing this. So I've done all these things and I, I wanna encourage you through this webinar because, well, I've done it and I, I just wanna show you all the things I've done and the mistakes I've made, okay? Finally, we're gonna talk about those other funding opportunities. Again, things that I've done. I've done them all. I've done all the funding opportunities you can think of um, and so we're gonna talk about all of those, okay? All right, let's jump into the tools really quick. Now, while you guys are listening, okay, give each other insight about your favorite tools, okay? So be sure to read the chat, guys, as I'm talking through this because there's a lot of tools that are gonna show up that I am not including. 2D, right off the bat. Unity is the first one, okay? Now, you can learn Unreal if you want. Unreal is the competitor. I just released a video about it today, but Unity is mainly the tool that people go, go for when it comes to 2D, okay? Then you're gonna need to learn Visual Studio or and, and C-sharp, but really it's just C-sharp. Visual Studio is basically just a notepad. I mean, it's got some cool features, but I mainly just use it as a notepad, like a PC notepad. You'll need to learn Photoshop, and then you're going to need to learn just the basics of utilizing the asset store and like other um, asset stores like craftpix.net, okay? It's totally fine to use assets. Totally fine to use assets. Now, this last one on this list here for the 2D column, uh, I didn't even want to include, but I sort of just threw it in, threw it in because you are gonna need to learn it. It's Audacity, it's totally free, okay? And most, all of these are free except for Photoshop, by the way. Photoshop, it's, you know, unless you, you figure out a way to crack the system, which I don't recommend, 
uh, <coughs> but uh, or like hack it. I, I don't recommend that. But maybe you can get a student discount um, or even just use a, a, a trial, right? Um, but Photoshop is the only one that's going to be paid. Anyway, back to Audacity. Audacity is free. It's a sound tool, and it's so easy to use. Um, it, it helps you edit sounds, right? From <coughs> websites that you can source sounds from, like freesound.org uh, or artlist.io. Um, that's what Audacity is for. Now, moving on to the 3D column, you're going to see some duplicates here, right? Unity, yeah, you're going to learn Unity. Unreal is great for 3D. I recommend Unity because, I mean, I, I just, I like unity <laughs> and they, they they they're sort of the dominant player they have the lion's share of the of the market um so i just like to use unity they have great documentation great learning tools and resources um <clears throat> and there's tons of tutorials on youtube for unity um again c sharp you're gonna need to learn that and also photoshop you're gonna need to learn that okay blender which is totally free that's a 3d tool okay and believe it or not you can make a 3d game by just getting the basics of these art tools, okay? Just understanding the basics of Blender, the, uh, the basics of Photoshop, you can, you can create a 3D game using the asset store, which is at the last part of this list here, Turbo Squid, which is more assets that you can download, Mixamo, which is a, a, it's a rigging tool that basically allows us to take rigs, and, and a rig would be like a skeleton, right? With, with, a, with a mesh with skin on it, and you can actually animate it with Mixamo, and it's super easy. It's it's like for children to use. It's that easy. Above Mixamo, you can see Fuse here. Fuse is, is that right, Fuse? I, I just had this weird feeling that Fuse is not correct. Let me double check. No, it's Fuse. It's, <laughs> it's Fuse. Yeah, um, so Fuse is basically just something that Valve made, which allows you to just customize characters, 3D characters, and then you upload them to Mixamo, <clears throat> and they'll do like all these cool animations, like talking, walking, dancing, and then finally, there's substance here. I've kind of gone through this sort of back and forth here. I haven't gone straight down the list, but there's also substance, which it was used. It used to be called Substance Painter, and it's basically just Photoshop, but like actually painting 3D models. Okay. So I know what you're thinking. You're like, wow, there's so much more to learn with 3D, and that's correct. Okay. It's going to be a lot easier for you to start with 2D. I think 3D games are probably, you're, you're much more likely going to make a profitable game, a much more profitable game if you make a 3D game because it stands out in the marketing material. But who am I to tell you that your 2D game isn't the next, you know, Hollow Knight, Owl Boy, uh, Super Meat Boy, or Stardew Valley, or, you know, um, Undertale. There's, 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 so, there's so many great 2D games out there, including I think my, great, my, my games are great. Um, my, my 2D games, Pinstripe and Neversong, which each of those, you know, have made more. I know Pinstripe has made more than 300,000, but I'm, I think it might be close to half a million. I'm not sure the exact numbers. Uh, Neversong was more than a half a million in, in revenue. So, you know, you can make a very simple 2D game that's two hours long and it can be very profitable for you. Okay, so those are the tools. Now, are we masters of these tools in three months? No, not at all. We've just gotten a basic understanding of how they work. This is where we begin to master, okay? For the next three months after that, you're going to start releasing crap games. Really, really crappy games. These are my crappy games, okay? One of them was called Coma. I made that when I was 18. That was a Flash game. You, put, you guys, maybe some of you don't know what Flash was. Flash was like itch.io. Right, itch.io is currently where people just upload, they just dump their games on itch.io and their free games that you play in your browser, or you can download them. Newgrounds was Flash games, okay? That was back in, in 2009, 2010, okay? 15 minute games, took me like four or five months to make, okay? This game called Skinny, I spent way too long in this game, Skinny, this is the middle one here. It's like a silhouetted Limbo-esque game, basically just copied Limbo. Um, that took me way too long. I think that took me like seven months. No, 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 no. That took me like five months. Um, but, you know, these games made me money. Full disclosure, they made me money, right? So I wouldn't call them crap games. Um, it's not because I'm being cocky. I just, I want to disclose that I did make money. I made 20000 off of Coma, 25000 off of Skinny from, a, from an award that I won. But this game, Flash Geometry Wars, I just ripped off Geometry Wars and made no money off that game but they're tiny games, guys. Now, why are we releasing crappy games? 
we're, we're basically sort of jump starting what is inevitable. There is like a, a rule of thumb. If I was to write like a proverb for game development, the proverb would be something like your first two games will be crap. Hands down 100%. There's no avoiding it. <laughs> That's my proverb. You cannot get away from the fact that your first games are going to be crap. Okay. And so, and by the way, there's a game on here. Flash Geometry Wars was my first game. My second game, I couldn't find a screenshot for it. It was called Pan's Apples. You're, you're Peter Pan and you fly around and collect apples. Those were two crappy games. It's The rule is your first two games are going to be crap. So here's the thing. Instead of dreaming up some great idea, and it might be genuinely a great idea, and, and instead of focusing all of your effort for two years, putting together all this effort to make a great game, just get the two crappy games out of the way. Because after those games, it's inevitable. It's kind of like, how many of you have looked back on your um, like middle school photos or when you were a freshman in high school, or maybe even some of you looking back on college and you're like, you see all, like you see yourself and you're like, you just see this flawed mess. That's what it feels like when you look at your, your games that you've made, okay? Now that slowly dissipates because I look back on like Never Song, which was my recent release, and I'm like, it's not crap. It's it's pretty good. Um, there's mistakes, but I look back on all my oldest games the same way I look back on high school photos. The second reason why you want to release crappy games is because you need to get used to the idea of releasing games, okay? You need to get addicted to it because I promise you, you're going to get a buzz or a high every time you release a game. Your body reacts and it builds up this, this addiction to actually getting stuff done, okay? Another way of putting it is you're creating a habit, okay? Most of you in the chat, I mean, just give me a, you know, a, a hand emoji, okay? Give me a hand emoji. How many of you in the chat still have not released a single game, yet you've been doing this for a while? You've been making games for a while and you just still won't release a game. You've, you're addicted to the fear of not releasing games. So you've got to start releasing crappy games. Do you release them on Steam? Those are cool hand emojis. Um, do you release them on Steam? No, you don't release crappy games on Steam. Steam is a marketplace. Itch.io is a dumpster. Sorry, Itch.io, but it is. <clears throat> you release crappy games on Itch.io and it takes like five seconds. Okay. So that's why you wanna release crappy games. The third reason why you release cra crappy games is to build a thick skin, okay? The thick skin allows you to fearlessly create a game that you're truly passionate about and not worry so much about bad reviews, okay? Your first two games that are inevitably gonna be crappy are going to get bad reviews. You're gonna get people in the comments who are nasty Okay. By the way, the same is true for YouTube. Like if I release a video, I just know I'm going to get crappy like comments, people who hate the video. And even if they, some of them might even be justified, right? The same is true with my games. I get bad reviews. I got a bad review from GameSpot, five out of 10 for my, my first commercial release. But that's just the way it goes, guys. And you've got to get used to it. I, th I would argue 80% of you are too scared to release games. Uh, or 80% of you don't release games and don't finish your games because you're scared of bad reviews. So you get, you, you get sent into this hell of just constantly tweaking your game. And then you get so burnt out that you quit. And that's all because you've never done it before and you're scared. You've got to release your game and get used to bad reviews, okay? So that's why we're releasing crappy games. So where are we at in the timeline? We're, we're six months down the road, right? Let's go. Let's fund our dream game. And when I say dream game, I guess what I mean is just your first commercial release, right? It's gonna be on Steam and then maybe port it to Switch, Xbox, PlayStation, right? Or maybe Apple Arcade. So these are my quote unquote dream games. My first one that I did was Pinstripe. This took four years to make and that's because I was caught in that death loop of constantly feeling nervous about my games, okay? Uh, about the game and thinking people would hate it. Then the next game was called Never Song. That was a huge, huge 
you know, opportunity because I actually sold it to Apple Arcade. And so Apple um, paid me for that game. Thank you, Apple, right? And then now we're working on a game called Father. Actually, we've changed the name to Twisted Tower, but that's the screenshot that I pulled for this webinar, okay? Now, all three of these games received funding, okay? So what I did was I built a prototype, and that's what that six months is for. So the last six months of this 12-month journey is building out a prototype, okay? Prototype, prototype, prototype. What does that mean? It means 15 minutes of gameplay, something like that, of just this hyper-polished, beautiful, like as if you had shipped the game and that's the first 15 minutes, okay? But you don't ship it. You rather send the demo and the pitch deck, and I'm gonna show you what a pitch deck is. You send that to a publisher, okay? And you maybe get it crowdfunded. What does that mean, Kickstarter? It means Indiegogo, right? It also means, you know, seeking out, um, for me, for Neversong, I, I received funding from a variety of other op option. <laughs> what am I saying? A variety of other areas as well, and we're gonna talk about that in a second as well, okay? So you fund your dream game, okay? There are two major funding opportunities for your prototype, okay? That's publishers, no, number one is publishers, and number two is Kickstarter, okay? Or Indiegogo. And to give you an idea of the numbers, I cannot disclose, just because I have contracts, I cannot disclose the exact funding numbers for let's say Pinstripe, but I can tell you that it was enough to fund me personally for a year, okay? So imagine being able to quit your job and you have enough money in the bank for a year for you to work full time and finish your game. Then the publisher will want to recoup that funding. So they'll recoup it in let's say a month after you launch the game. If the game does decent on Steam, they'll get that money back. And then you'll do something like split it 50-50 or 60-40, okay? meaning you get 60% of the revenue. So that's kind of how a publisher relationship works. Now, you're going to want to start securing other funding opportunities, and we're gonna talk about this, because you don't wanna be caught in that rat race of always securing funding from a publisher. You eventually wanna disconnect from that because you've now figured out how to make other money in other places. Assuming you, you just release a mediocre game, okay? now. There's some games like Cult of the Lamb where it's like they partnered with De Devolver and those guys are sitting pretty now, right? And they don't ever need a publisher ever again, right? Never Song, the funding opportunities were different, okay? Yes, we partnered with a publisher. Yes, we did a Kickstarter campaign which raised over $80,000, right? But we also received funding from Apple, okay? So you guys kind of hearing a a pattern here, and that is you don't have to just get funding from one place, okay? You don't just say, I'm gonna get funding from Kickstarter. It's like, well, no, you can get funding from Kickstarter, but a publisher would be really helpful as well because then you could hire more people, um, you could have more padding in your, in your budget because frankly, every game goes over budget. <laughs> and also, you can partner with these platforms. What are some platforms out there? Epic Games, right? Um, Steam, now does Steam offer funding? No, so take that back. PlayStation, yes, they'll fund your game if you do some kind of PlayStation deal. Okay, what is it, Game Pass or PlayStation Plus? Um, Microsoft, Game Pass, right? They're gonna offer you funding. Did I say Apple Arcade? But Apple Arcade, that's, that's where I received additional funding, okay? And then all during this, guys, all during the crowdfunding and getting publishers to publish my game and all during the process of partnering with these big platforms like Apple Arcade, I was also receiving funding from selling, um, or not selling, I'm sorry, uh, that, that's, that's something else in the future, we'll talk about that. Um, sponsorship deals, so doing videos on YouTube, right? A lot of people in the comments of my videos will say stuff like, Thomas isn't a full-time game developer because he does YouTube. And I'm like, 
Well, first, who cares if I'm doing YouTube? That's just my method of promoting my games. So what? But second, I didn't start doing that until midway through Never Songs development. So that was the second game. So all of my funding opportunities were secured without YouTube, including the Never Song Kickstarter campaign. I haven't even done a Kickstarter campaign or secured funding by utilizing my channel. The channel only brought in ad revenue of let's say $1,000 a month, um, probably halfway through Never Song's development. Uh, from ad revenue, it was really like $700 a month. It's not a lot. Um, and then also like deals with sponsorships like Skillshare or Udemy or even Unity, which would be like another $1,000 a month, okay? But those are, those are small drips of funding. And then also Patreon, right? I, I've recently, I think it was two or three years ago, or two years ago, I stopped doing Patreon because frankly, I didn't need the money. Um, but Patreon is another opportunity, okay? But I digress, honestly, because the three main funding, res funding sources for your game, and I've done all three, is sending keys of your game. I'm sorry, sending keys of your demo, or maybe just a private itch.io page, sending that demo to publishers. And that means uh, like 100 plus email addresses, <clears throat> excuse me, of indie game publishers. Okay, that's the Devolvers, right? The Tiny Builds, the Armor Games, the Serenity Forge, Armor Games and Serenity Forge I partnered with. Um, uh, did I say Tiny Build? I said uh, a Curve, Curve, Team 17, right? Sending your demo and your pitch deck. And by the way, if you wanna see a pitch deck, let me pull that up really quick. What is a pitch deck? A pitch deck, give me just a sec here, a pitch deck, is your game on a website, pay, a web page like this here. This is, this is Father's Pitch Deck. It has a trailer and it has your plot, it has demos, it has screenshots, right? It has me saying hello, right? Looking like an idiot. Got, I have my credentials here of what I've done in the past, right? And then you send this off with the demo. And by the way, my demo is actually just links are here. So everything was actually in the Pitch Deck and I just sent it to a a ton of publishers. I was much more picky with my publishers because this is my third game. So I only sent it to about 10. Okay. Does that make sense? So, you know, all in all, um, that's what it, it means to fund your game. You spend six, just for in conclusion here, for funding your game. For the first six months, you learn how to make games and you release two crappy games. For the last six months, what are we doing? We're making our game, our first commercial release, and we're building out just a prototype. I'm talking 15 minutes, 15 minutes of gameplay, and a beautiful, beautiful trailer, and a beautiful, beautiful pitch deck on a website like Squarespace or Wix, okay? And hopefully, by that 12th month, you've got publishers handing you checks or offering to hand you checks or uh, it'd be a wire transfer of 50,000 to $500,000. I know that sounds crazy. What? 500 grand? Thomas is lying. Thomas is a snake oil salesman. No, I'm telling you, this is what, this is what indie game developers do guys. And half a million dollars is, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's, I think it's at the higher end of like smaller indie games. I, well, Medium, medium sized indie games that is at the higher end. But if you think about it, it's like, it's just like the, the, the cost of a house and you've got these get, just drive by any neighborhood being built and you've got these construction teams just building out millions of dollars of houses. Think of a publisher like that. It's like, they're gonna put in 150 grand. The house will be done in a year, two years, um, house being a game. And then they start making money off of it, right? And they'll recoup the money. So it's not even, you know, in a weird way, it's not super risky. Um, but yeah, it's not crazy. It's not crazy. Now, I will end with this before we move on to the next slide. There are risks associated with working with a publisher. A publisher should do more than fund your game. They should actually be marketing your game. And I have a whole video about that. You can just type in Thomas Brush Publishers. And there's, I think there's two videos on YouTube about that, okay? 
Okay. Now let's talk about these other funding sources. Okay, guys. Um, I think this is really important to clarify um, because, well, for the first for the first six, I think it's five or six years of my career as like a full time game developer. Let's just say five. I think it, I think it might be five. Like I just can't remember. 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Maybe it's seven. I don't know. For the first like minimum five years of my indie game career, the funding came from publishers crowdfunding and obviously just game sales, right? Just selling games and making money from the games once they were finished. But there is no reason I think it would be foolish if you have skill sets and talents in other areas for you not to start bringing in more income for your studio from other places. <clears throat> this is not during the first 12 months. This is once you get that deal from a publisher and you get funding while you're finishing your game the next 12 months, you also start doing these things. And the goal here is to have enough of a drip of income coming in month to month so that eventually you just don't need funding anymore. You don't need publishers, okay? And I'm in that situation now, let me explain. First one is YouTube, okay? Let's talk about YouTube. Why would you do like devlogs? Do, do you guys know what devlogs are? They're like vlogs, but about you developing your game. The reason you do this is you build, slowly build a YouTube channel that brings in a small drip of ad revenue. Guys, I make like $1,000 a month. And I'm saying, I'm using that face, $1,000 a month. Not to brag, I'm saying that's bad. That's not a lot of money. I'm grateful for it, but it's not like, ooh, Thomas makes $1,000 a month. He's like, no, it's a tiny bit of income but it is something okay now you can also bring in if you want to take sponsorships you can almost you can bring in let's say three hundred dollars to like four thousand dollars a pop for sponsorship reads okay like a 40 second sponsored ad read okay i don't do these anymore because i just don't think it's worth my time um now there's also just i put slash social here because social media is a great way to just build an audience and audience building in general is a valuable thing to do. Okay. It's just a valuable thing to do uh, because I can then do the next three things here with that audience. Okay. So you're building an audience. You, people get this so backwards. The primary, the primary um, focus for let's say doing social media and YouTube, it should not be making money right off the bat. I've heard plenty of people tell me, oh, Thomas, I want to start a YouTube channel. And I say, why? And they go, I want to get that ad revenue. And I'm like, that is not, or even like sponsorship, sponsorships, or people, they, they're going to send me free stuff. I'm going to get, I'm going to get a cool free gadget in the mail. And I'm thinking that is like the last thing on my mind. These next three things are why you build a social media audience on YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, right? Email. And by the way, I do all of that. The first one is you can sell your assets, okay? So for example, if you decide to quit your game, hey, break it up into some assets and start selling them. Let's say you have some really cool low poly models, create a low poly asset pack and sell it on the Unity Asset Store. I don't know if it's gonna be that much money, but if you've got some YouTube ad revenue, some sponsorship ad revenue, and some Patreon ad revenue, and then you also have some asset store revenue, suddenly it's all stacked up. Okay. And these are things that you shouldn't really have to work that hard on. Okay. Selling assets includes selling code, right? Selling code coded like game kits and stuff. And, and I'm going to be selling one of those this year. Okay. It also means you can do contract work as well. I know, you know, I have, um, AJ, I don't know if you're in the chat right now, but AJ is a contract worker. Um, he's one of my subscribers and he does work for me. Um, so, and also Andrew, you do some work for me as well um, for, for video editing. So, so just slowly bringing in little drips of income um, by selling your services and your assets, is, is, it can build up over time. Training and coaching is ridiculously profitable. I like to be completely transparent here. Well, you know, it's like, it's, <laughs> it's a huge, huge portion of my income these days. 
um, because it's premium programs, right? And I know there's plenty of you in the chat who are students of mine, okay? And you can see pinned, pinned, pinned as a comment right now is my course. Now, the reason I could be so open about this with you guys and say it brings in a ton of income is because I'm not selling something that I don't think is worth it, right? And so it's very important when you sell training and when you sell coaching, the number one, the most important thing is that you're selling something that you truly understand and that you've done. I would not feel good about selling these programs and they're premium. I would not sell good, feel good about this if I didn't know that what I do, what I offer works and that I haven't done it myself, okay? So if you're going to start doing training and coaching programs and, and, and doing you know tutorials and stuff like that, please you know at least do it first like actually learn how to make games first before you start teaching it okay because i feel like you're kind of shortcutting people um so do it yourself first okay so the first you know 70 i would say like the first 70 percent of my career was just making games and just making you know uh, securing funding from publishers crowdfunding platforms and also just platform sales, like actually selling games. But then a couple of years ago, I started doing training material, okay? And training material has become extremely profitable as well, okay? What does, what, what does this material, the funding from this material help me do? Well, it helps me make bigger games and not rely on publishers. Does that make sense? So I've got all in all, and by the way, the last one here is Patreon. I don't do Patreon anymore, but Patreon is a great way to make money as well. But you can't do that unless you have an audience. But this giant rainbow, guys, this giant rainbow of all these different funding opportunities for me, all these funding opportunities, it's not just one, and it's not just one here and just one here. It's this, this kaleidoscope of funding opportunities. All of these ensure that I don't have to necessarily, I might get a publisher, but I don't necessarily have to get a publisher and I've got a team, I've got me, I've got Felipe who's full-time, I've got part-time workers as well, of contract workers, and we're making games together, right? So I have this massive, you know, I, I call it spinning plates. We've got all these different funding um, opportunities and they all drive revenue to actually fund projects, okay? You don't do this at once. That's why I recommend this is, the, this is something you do the second year. Okay, the first year is focused on releasing crappy games. Okay, it's focused on releasing crappy games and um, then, then working on a prototype that's hyper polished. It's not finished, it's just 15 minutes of a hyper polished demo. And then, while you're working on that game, slowly start building up these other funding opportunities. Okay, slowly start building these up. Guys, you don't, well, you don't build Rome in a year. You don't, you don't build this you know, video game funding machine in a year. You can build a prototype in a year and then secure six figures from that prototype. Totally, totally possible. But these four are things that you start doing after the fact, okay? And I gotta say, this right here, this slide, this is my the slide that makes me smile the most because this one, allows me to sleep at night. This is the one where I go, thank God for all these funding opportunities. Thank God that not all of my eggs are in one basket. Not all of my funding is coming from a publisher and they can manipulate me and make me do whatever they want me to do. Thank God that I'm not just relying on game sales and hoping that my game does well. Cause I can release Twisted Tower, which is our third game. And it's like, if it doesn't do well, it's like, well, we'll be all right because we have all these other opportunities, including game sales. We're still making money from our games. So that's, that's honestly, that's the 12 month path. Really it's about a 24 month path. In conclusion, before we move on to Q and A, and I'm really excited about Q and A, and that's just you guys asking questions. Before we move on to that, remember how I said at the beginning of this webinar, I was really nervous about this. I'm really nervous about leading you guys astray. I, I would hate for one of you to just have a really rough go of it because you followed my advice. 
please know that everybody's different. There's a couple things here. Everybody's different, okay? So some people might do it in 12 months. Some people might do it in five years, like me, because I'm an idiot. Some people might not be able to do it all, not because they're an idiot, but because their skills and strengths are better suited for more targeted work. What does that mean? Not everybody is, is gifted in the plate spinning arena or the hat wearing arena. What I mean is wearing a bunch of hats and doing a lot of different things and managing a ton of different projects. Not everybody's gifted at that. That doesn't mean you're not smart. It means that you're much more gifted at being hyper-targeted with a singular task, like coding, 3D modeling, marketing, okay, Ma project management. So just because some of you, this, this whole being an indie game developer thing doesn't work, it doesn't mean you're not smart, okay? It just means that this is not your gifting, and that's okay. So I wanted to make sure I clarify that because I really, like the older I get, the more I'm like, man, I really hope, I really hope that I don't lead somebody astray, okay? So everybody's different, all right? So let's move on, let's move on to the Q&A, okay? I would love to focus this Q&A on this, okay? I would love you guys to focus <clears throat> your questions on these four things, okay? So as you guys write your questions related to these four things, just remember that if you're interested in, like imagine if this webinar was 30 hours long or 45 hours long, and it was everything that I've learned in the last 10 years, that's available right now for the New Year's sale event. And again, this is another thing that funds my games. So I appreciate all of my students. Um, but more importantly, it does, you know, support you guys in your future. So be sure to check out the link above or below or also in the chat for the New Year's sale event. 50% off full-time game dev, which is this massive, highly rated program. It teaches you funding. It teaches you C-sharp. It teaches you how to do a Kickstarter campaign. It teaches you how to hit the Steam front page. It teaches you how to get press coverage. It teaches you how to um, make a 3D game. 2D art is also included in this program, this massive 2D art program, totally free. It teaches how to make beautiful 2D art with just simple shapes and colors. There's about 90 seats left, I believe, and 14 days left. So be sure to check out the link below. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into, <clears throat> hmm. let's go ahead and jump into the, here I am, <laughs> the Q&A, all right guys? Let's jump into the Q&A. And I, guys, I really appreciate you being willing to let me do these ad reads for the course. It does support the channel and it just means a lot to me. So thank you so, 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 so much. Uh, do you have to buy Thomas's course to be a full-time game developer? No, obviously not. But it definitely makes things a lot easier. I know that. I wish I had taken something like that when I first started instead of spending 40 grand on college. Thanks, Dad. Uh, but, you know, anyway. Um, Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into these questions, guys. Wow, we've got a ton of really cool questions. Um, ooh, Hello World is asking a very interesting question. Me and a few of my friends are trying to start making a big game, and we are high schoolers. Awesome. We've been making a game for a while now. Any advice on starting the game? Well, I would just say this. Um, starting a game with your friends is dangerous because if the game does really, really well, everyone's gonna be fighting for the lion's share of the revenue. Okay, let's say you made a game and it made a million bucks, uh, and you have no agreement, no contract signed, nothing. Um, so I would recommend you find a lawyer friend or an uncle who understands legal stuff and just emailing them or calling them and saying, hey, can you draft up some kind of agreement where we all get a certain percentage of this game if and when we launch it, right? Um, so that's, that's what I would do when it comes to starting a game, even, even if you're in high school. Cause like, look, my, my first game that I made in high school, I released it at the end of my senior year, made 20 grand. Can you imagine if I had made it with a friend and we didn't have a contract, what would we do? Right. Um, I think it's really important to, to take note of, um, okay. 
Let's see here. Anything else? Any other questions? We got a lot of questions. I don't know anything about Godot gaming engine, so yeah. <laughs> Lucas Corey says, I'm spending $40,000 on college and I want to take your course. Oh man. Yeah. I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, college, I don't, I, I don't want to talk about college because I don't want to lead anybody astray. I went to college and I guess I'm glad I went, I guess. Uh, but not really. <laughs> okay, anyway, how do you get people's emails? Well, cross code or official? I'm sure plenty of people in the chat can tell you how Thomas does it. Um, I like to be super transparent. Um, th what the way I do it is I offer free goodies, you know, and I say in the in the email subscription, I say get the free goodie, and by the way, I'll tell you when something's on sale. So it allows me to say, look, something's on sale, like for New Year's, for example, or I can or I can tell people a game's out, or go wish list my game. Um, but you do it by offering free stuff. Okay, so for example, the free goodie that you offer should be associated with what's going to be sold in the long run, okay? So let's say you're trying to capture email addresses, AKA wish lists. If you're trying to do that, well, you need to be offering a free goodie that is directly correlated to what you're eventually going to sell, okay? Because you wanna build up a pool of people who are what are called warm leads, people who want to buy your game, okay? So if it's a video game that you wanna sell in a year, then you need to offer a free demo to those people in exchange for an email address. This is not some side note that I'm telling you. This is insanely valuable. This is why Steam has wish lists. It's the same thing. You want to be able to market to very, very warm leads, okay? So if you got a list of, I don't know, let's say 40,000 people, and 10, let's just make it a, uh, a simple number. I'm so bad at math, but like, let's say 50,000 people, uh, and you sold, you sold 10,000 copies, um, or you converted, you know, 10,000 of those for a $10 game. Um, isn't that a hundred thousand bucks? Is that? Yeah. It's a hundred thousand bucks. So that's, that's the value in building a wish list. Uh, oh, I, I, I like to own my own lists. So yes, it's great to have Steam wish list because it stimulates the Steam algorithm, but I also try my best to secure a, a list of people in MailChimp as well so that I can target them whenever I want to, okay? And you guys should be doing that while you're building out your prototype. Seriously, you should start building your social media audience ASAP. All right. Um, okay, okay. Question, this is from Mez Merritt. Thomas, I watched the unlocking and it was amazing. Oh no, we don't want to talk about filmmaking right now. I don't want to water down this conversation, but I appreciate it. I really, really do. Um, that's my short horror film that I made, by the way, guys. Um, on my second chain, second channel. Um, question. This is from Jay. I'm afraid that if I market my game first with devlogs and don't release it, then that would be pretty bad. No. Who cares? Who cares? I. I I think I think most game developers experience, I think it's called the spotlight effect. Um, especially if they're doing devlogs because I'm looking at a spotlight right now. I have a big light right here. So that's me being trying to be funny. But spotlight, uh, the spotlight effect is you think that people care more about you than they actually do. Uh, like for example, if I made up like 20 devlogs about making this game called Twisted Tower, and then on the 21st devlog, I made some hyper sappy and I would get Andrew to help me edit it because he's an incredible editor. I would make some hyper sappy video and it would be this. It would be like my face like this. And it would say, I quit my game after two years. That video would get like 300,000 views. And what would I do with that video? You'd say, hey, join my mailing list or hey, wish list my next game idea. It's at every, Failure is such a good opportunity because it creates clicks. I love failure opportunities because I'm like, ah, oh, we got ourselves a video, right? It's a great opportunity to make great content, okay? And utilize that to your advantage. Don't ever let, don't ever let an embarrassing story go to waste, okay? So I would argue, put your stuff out on social media all day long because people at the end of the day are gonna be interested in your failure because why? Well. Some people like to laugh at people's failure, failure, but most people 
actually just really enjoy it because they feel the same way, all right? You're not the first person to quit your game. And I think it's admirable that you'd put yourself out there, right? So, question, I just started, this from Zandrew. <clears throat> I just started working on a game today and I already feel stumped in a way I don't have a set in stone idea, just a concept, okay? Um, so, basically you're just saying you're still struggling to get a full set in stone idea. I'm thinking about things to work on is overwhelming. How do you handle that? Uh, I highly, highly recommend using other games, other other indie games, not other AAA games, other indie games as templates, okay? One of the best ways to get through game development block, it's like writer's block, but it's for game developers, is just look at games that have a similar budget or scope that yours does and just look at what they did, okay? So honestly, Zandrew, can you, can you tonight, um, can you write down five games that are kind of inspiring to you and similar to your idea? And then break down what's the core game loop? And by the way, the game loop is, what does the player do over and over and over and over again? So for example, in Portal, they enter a room, they shoot portals, and they unlock a door. Basically, that's kind of what it is. That's the loop. So what's the core game loop of all these games? What's the story of all these games? Can you use a tradition? It all comes down to templating. And don't be, don't be, don't be embarrassed to use templates. So what I mean is, regarding the story, can you use a, a, a traditional character arc or a story arc to, to basically, it's like playing Mad Libs. It's like the hero was very sad because he was blank and he felt like he would never ever blank. Then one day he met a sage and the sage told him blank and then he flew to outer space and then he blank and he destroyed blank and, and, and evil and the world was happier. Like that's the traditional like hero story arc, right? Um, <clears throat> you could just fill in the blanks there and you got yourself a story, okay? So the, you know, in conclusion to answer your question, I would just say, don't be afraid to just use templated stuff, okay? Most of us, including myself, aren't geniuses. Don't treat yourself like you're a genius, okay? We live in an era where things get made so quickly. Why, why does Marvel, why do Marvel movies get made so freaking quickly? Why does Stephen King release books like every month? Why, <laughs> why do so many games get made so quickly? It's because we're in an era where everybody's using templates and resources and assets and they're just knocking stuff out so freaking quickly. Um, and by the way, love him or hate him, like, I don't even know if I can say his name, Andrew T-A-T-E, love him or hate him, he, he does say something about this, which is most people when they start a project or start a business or, or start something with like an entrepreneurship gig, they, they think that they have to spend years and years and years cultivating something. When in reality, you can just use templates and resources and just knock it out fast, get it done quickly. So shrink the scope of your schedule, shrink it down and slam it to a tight 12 months. And then suddenly you're gonna be much more willing to start using assets and templates and resources, okay? All righty. I feel like that was really good advice. Um, <laughs> what if you're barely able to, able, okay, this is from Zrai Dev. What if you're barely able to sustain one source of revenue? How do you go about building other sources of funding when you already waxing out your band, maxing out your bandwidth? Zrai, you got to figure out a system. You got to figure out how, like, you got to figure out a source of revenue that can, run on its own and you need to be able to use re sort um, resources and software that will run it on its own see the thing is is that you're making revenue there's a potential that let's say you're making assets okay for the unity asset store you should start figuring out what sells and what doesn't that's the first question and then you need to figure out a way to automate that process or at least reduce the amount of effort that you have to put into it, okay? So the first step of ever building some source, of, some stream of income, the first step is for you to get your hands dirty and figure out how to make something profitable, okay? So for example, uh, Thomas makes um, a YouTube video 
and the 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 ad revenue for that or the sponsorship let's say a sponsorship gig a sponsor comes to me let's say it's unity and they say thomas will give you a thousand dollars for this video my job is to first figure out how to what my audience likes so that that video gets views and then unity sees a return on their investment once I've figured out how to make that video, you template it back to templates. You template it. You go, okay, this is what works for my channel. And by the way, it's not that you're making cheap content. It's that you're just making content that people like. You figured out the system that works and you just do it over and over and over again. Does that mean that you do it over and over and over again? No, you find someone else to do it for you, but you're the master. You're the puppeteer. You know what works and what doesn't. Okay. So the same is true with games. That's why you make crappy games and then you figure out how to, like for example, my team right now is, is basically using the Thomas Brush formula to make a game. That doesn't mean I'm not highly involved. It just means I'm not nearly as involved as I was with my previous two games. A great leader, a great entrepreneur knows how to send the equation that they learned for their own skills and their talents to send that equation into someone else's brain and then they can do it themselves. Your hands do not need to be involved in everything. I would say your hands should be basically, the way I see it is my hands are best spent working on R&D, okay? So I'm a creative director for one, but I'm also just doing R&D all day long. R&D is just research and development, trying to figure out new products, new things that I can sell or new game ideas once I craft and figure out exactly what makes it profitable and what makes it work, then I create some sort of automated system to let it run on its own. Now I'll be completely honest with you guys. I don't want to fool you. Nothing that I have is fully automated. Okay. It's not like my courses are just completely automated and sale events happen. It's not like my games just make themselves. I got to pay for all of this, but at the end of the day, the goal is for me to do less than I used to do because now I have a template or a system that works for me, okay? So Zry Dev, if you can't figure out a way, let's say in two years to get what you're currently making that is profitable, if you can't figure out a way to automate it in some way, you're never gonna have multiple plates spinning. You're never gonna have multiple income streams. The only way you get a good, an income, like an income stream implies that it flows. And the way that it flows is that well, it's like a it's like a water wheel. It should just basically do it on its own. But you got to build the water wheel. You got to build the system, okay? Um, and that's done with software, right? And there's tons of leverage when it comes to software. So for example, like Zapier, creating Zaps. Zaps allow me to send out automated emails all day long to students and um, people who join my email list, for example. Okay. When it comes to games, using like an email subscription form that sends out automated emails to people who join the wish list for my next game, right? To keep people, you know, posted about the game or whatever, or send the free demo to, to these people. It's automated through Zapier, okay? Um, another form of automation, just FYI, another form of automation is this video right now, okay? Why? Because I would say 50% of you watching right now are actually watching when it's not live. Not now, not you, <laughs> but people who are watching the replay of this live stream, okay? And boop, there we go. There's an ad right there, okay? It's all automated. I could I could put down here, wish list, wish list my next game. That's an automated system that just works for me throughout 2023, okay? So that's why social media is so valuable. If you're, if you're, if you wanna advertise something, then create quality content and then people will, for example, join your wish list on Steam like Danny does. Danny's getting wish lists all day long. Choo Choo Charles creator Gavin is getting wish lists all day long because he spent two hours making a video. Okay, that's automation. All right. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, uh, Thespis says, sir, are you not gonna develop games with Unity anymore? Thespis is asking because I think I, I just, well, I think you're asking because I just released a video about whether I'm going to move to Unreal. I, from the research that I've done, Unity and Unreal are just, it's just like pick your poison at this point. 
granted, Unreal has some really cool stuff. They have some really awesome lighting tools that Unity does not, um, which is Lumen, L-U-M-E-N, and then also Nanite, N-A-N-I-T-E. Great real-time lighting, which makes your game look incredible. And then Nanite is real-time auto LOD, and that's level of detail generation for 3D objects. So for example, this mug is super high poly, but as we move away from the camera, it should basically become a cube, all right? That's, that's gonna create re the ability to, to have a ton of objects in the scene, a ton of like millions of mugs in the scene, and it automatically generates those. Unity doesn't have this. That's cold. Unity doesn't have that, okay? That's a big deal if you're making like an open world game. But my theory is Unity is gonna create it and they're gonna have their own version in a year, so I'm not worried. Okay, so no, I'm not moving to Unreal. I'm just gonna stick with Unity. At one point, everyone will jump ship to Unreal 5 and leave Unity for 2D. I don't agree with that at all. Unity's not stupid. They're gonna, they're gonna make, Unity is gonna come out with tools when we ask for them. So that's because they need our money. So yeah. Hey Thomas, is it okay to participate in a Steam Game Festival with my demo? I don't know if that's a good idea. You're not gonna win. <laughs> It's good because it's a demo. Uh, so I wouldn't even, I'm just being blunt. I don't think that would benefit you at all. Maybe it would, honestly, I don't know. Don't take my advice. How do you define what a publisher can take and what a publisher can do? Oh, that's, I mean, that's a good question, code, uh, cross coder official. Uh, through a contract. So you, you're never gonna work with a publisher without signing a contract. Now, when I sign a contract for, let's say, buying a house, I just sign everything. So you, you, you go into the, to the, how many of you have bought a house? You go into the lawyer's office on closing day and you sign like 300 sheets of paper and you're like, what the f am I signing? But you just do it. It's just common practice. You just sign everything. Do you do that with a publisher? No, no. <laughs> the publisher, you go through every line like it was written by Satan himself. Even if it's like the greatest publisher in the world, you go through every single line with a fine tooth comb looking for lice. Where is the thing that's gonna suck my blood and I don't know it? And you do that with a lawyer, okay? So let's say you've got a $50,000 contract with a publisher. They send it over and you're like, you call your mom and you're like, holy mom, I just got a $50,000 contract from a publisher. I'm so excited. What you need to be thinking is, Two to three thousand, like maybe one to three thousand dollars of that is gonna go to. I don't know why I'm still talking to my mom. Uh, let's hang hang that up. Okay, <laughs> one to three thousand dollars of fees to a lawyer should be reduced from that total. You need to be thinking, I've got to pay a lawyer because guys, that one meeting with a lawyer is going to be worth potentially millions of dollars. Or in my case, something like, I would say like a hundred grand, like, because there's certain, there's certain clauses in a contract that are going to screw you over. For example, here's just one. A publisher is going to recoup a hundred. Let's say they get a hundred. They sign, you sign a hundred thousand dollar contract with a publisher. A publisher is going to say, every publisher is going to say this. They're going to say a hundred thousand dollars is going to be recouped period at launch. So you launch your game, 100% of that revenue generally is gonna go directly into the publisher's pocket until they get the money back. So they gave you 100 grand. It's not a loan because a loan is legally you have to repay it. In this case, it's not like you have, like if your game doesn't make $100,000, then you're not like gonna get sued. But a publisher is, and by the way, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, so contact your lawyer. I'm just telling you from my experience. So don't take my advice. That's a legal disclaimer. But a publisher is going to say, look, if the game makes $100,000 on Steam, we get that back first. That's just normal, that's the way it works. One of the things that a contract should say is it should say, how much, of, how much does the publisher actually get back, okay? Does it include the expenses for the game? Does it include the marketing for the game? 
if the publisher throws a party for their internal team, for their secretary and their internal developer and their marketing agent, if they throw a party and they spend $3,000 on a cake and pizza and beer, the publisher might go, hey, dude, we threw a party. And uh, actually, that there's that $3,000 wasn't recouped. And you're like, what $3,000? And they're like, the party. And you're like, but that's not included. And then they go to the contract and it says, actually, yes, we can recoup expenses. So you've got to make sure that that's clear. Sometimes in your brain, you're thinking, well, that's so abstract. The contract doesn't specifically say you can recoup expenses. Sometimes abstraction, I would argue that abstraction in a contract is your worst enemy because the, the publisher who has more power than you is going to say to a, to a judge, they're going to say, well, it doesn't say we can't recoup expenses from a strip club party. <laughs> so you want to make sure that that's all very, very clear. Okay. So I often have my lawyer write out an equation that says, this is what recoup looks like. It includes the net revenue. It, the net revenue is part of the equation. What is net revenue? Net revenue does not include any expenses except for that 30% that Valve takes. Okay, so that's right off the top. And then what's below? That 75% or whatever. That's what we what what is included in the recoup. Okay. This is all stuff you should be talking to a, a lawyer about. Okay. But I also have videos on this. Okay, so just type in Thomas Brush Publishers and that'll really, really help. Okay, that'll really, really help you. Okay, Craft Bud Studios. Question, do those online courses, not boot camps, that provide certs hold any market value, uh, excuse me, to recruiters? No. I'm just gonna say my opinion here. This isn't my like professional advice. This is just Thomas the douchebag talking. No. That's silly. Don't get a certificate. Make a portfolio, okay? Do a, build your portfolio. Don't worry about certification. And this is coming from like an indie game development perspective, but also like if you want to work for a studio, I don't think they care about your certification. If you've got a really cool series of demos in your portfolio with like these awesome trailers and art, that's what I would look at when I when I'm considering a t considering a team member to work on one of my games. I don't care about their certification. That means nothing to me. Because what's what's a certification at the end of the day? It's going through some learning modules and paying a handsome fee to get it. So it really doesn't promise me that somebody's smart, you know? Uh, <laughs> okay, Ibrahim. Um Ibrahim, can you stop spamming, please? Can you stop spamming? Also, Rashidu uh, the people who spam will not get their questions answered. So just stop. Stop. Okay. I'm going to ban you. Here we go. Yeah. Bye-bye. Um, also, who else gets banned? Ah, uh, Ibrahim. Sorry guys, that's just not cool. All right, um, anyway, let's move forward here. Uh, I am learning Construct. I mean, I would do a timeout, but you know you shouldn't do that. So just see you later. Um, when you have, Newman says, thanks for your valuable time, Thomas. Yeah, you bet, you bet. Um, is this live Q&A regarding a new course? No, it's not about a new course. I just want to help you guys out. I The course is in the banner at the bottom. Let me hide that because I think some of you might be confused. That's just letting you know there's a sale event that started today. Um, doing, this is a question from Lil Boy Greasy. Doing the interviews with other indie devs really gives a lot of insight. Do you have any of them planned? Oh, no, not recently. Not, 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 um, not anything in the books right now or on schedule or whatever the phrase is. Um, no. Uh, Maka Yusa, no, that, no. Um, do I ever get game dev burnout? Yeah, all the time. Um, so if you're not getting game dev burnout, it's, well, I mean, it, it's not a career. Like any career 
you're going to get burnout. You're going to feel overwhelmed. You're going to feel exhausted because your brain is always spinning around primarily that one topic or that game idea. So you're going to get burnout. Um, burnout's inevitable. Uh, you just got to learn how to mitigate it. So for me, I, how do I avoid burnout? I'm still working on that, honestly. So are indie games dead? The indie game industry is, I, w I would say it's going through sort of a Phoenix moment where it burns and then it comes back better because it's kind of like that last slide I was showing you guys, which is like uh, this right here. Um, this is sort of the Phoenix rising, which is like, yes, you can make, yes, you do and I do make money from publishers and also game sales, obviously. But the opportunities for indie game developers to make money elsewhere are much stronger. Uh, because building a YouTube media or YouTube or a social media presence and then generating revenue from selling assets or training materials or videos or sponsorship gigs or Patreon and having a, a small community of thousands of people who support your work, that is much easier than it used to be. So I would argue the revenue opportunities are bigger and greater um, for the people who know how to utilize social media to their benefit. Uh, but if, you're, if your end goal is just, hey, I'm going to sell a game and make a million bucks on Steam, I mean, people do that all the time, but that's like, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a gamble. So that's why I like to put, I'm, I'm not a risk taker. I've never been a risk taker. I'm very much a risk avoider. Um, or what's the word? Risk averse. I'm risk averse. And uh, that's why I like to put my eggs in a lot of different baskets. Again, what are my baskets? I make money from game sales. I make money from, you know, Apple Arcade. I make money from uh, Steam and Humble Bundle and Kickstarter. And I used to make money from Patreon. I uh, make money from publishers and investors. Um, I make money from selling online courses. I make money from, um, we're going to be making money from assets that we sell this year. Um, sponsorships, I used to make money from sponsorships. I make money from ad revenue. Uh, I make money from Omega Destroyer, <laughs> who's, uh, thank you so much, Omega. Um, has a, Omega has a question, uh, super chat. Your opinion on creating tools for automation, content creation, then repackaging them and selling to other devs? Uh, well, I would just say that the person who makes the tools for the gold rush makes the most money. And that's, I didn't come up with that. That's a, that's a common quote. Uh, so like, for example, Thomas Brush was, was and is part of the gold rush which is I make video games, AKA I'm digging for gold, but also I make hat, uh, axes and barrels and uh, wheelbarrows and uh, dynamite for people who want to dig for gold. And that is, you know, selling assets and resources. So I do both because again, I'm risk averse. I'm not gonna be the one going into, oh, I'm not only gonna go in and place the dynamite and blow up, it's been two years trying to look for gold and blow up this cave. I'm also gonna go outside and sell dynamite to other people who want to go do that, okay? I'm not trying to sell dynamite and have people get hurt. I genuinely, because I genuinely believe in the gold rush too. Well, I wouldn't be making games if I didn't believe in the gold rush. But I think people should be doing both. I think people should be making tools for automation and content creation and selling them to developers because it is profitable. I mean, fr frankly, it's like, if you're gonna be making games, why not sell the tools that you're creating to make those games, right? Um, so for me, I, I, I have a process for making games, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell that as well as training material. I have a game kit that I made for the PewDiePie. I give that away free, but I made a game kit for to make a game for PewDiePie. And I was like, well, why don't I just package that and give it away for free? But also this 3D game we're making, we made a game kit for this and we're gonna, we're gonna start selling that this year or in 2023. So there's no reason guys why you should be <laughs> only making games. You should be making resources as well uh, because that's supplemental in income and then you don't have to suck at the tea of publishers all day long, okay? Um, yeah. Yeah. 
So, hey, by the way, Daryl, Daryl D says, yeah, because I need a game kit for VR. Well, make one and then sell it and then utilize it for your game. So guys, it's kind of like um, the way that I see this new economy is like, I mean, it's not new. It's just, it's, I, I really enjoy it. And I think it's, it's, it's a fresh perspective. Imagine if Blizzard, they, not only did they sell games, but they also sold the resources that they created to make their games, like an engine. And then they also, what if there was something called Blizzard University? And it was like this premium program that taught you how to make Blizzard style games. So that's sort of this interesting business model. I would call it, uh, edu uh, <laughs> it's kind of like educational entertainment. It's like selling games and resources. And it's this massive wheel. Um, it can be overwhelming and I'm not gonna do it for the rest of my life. Um, I'll probably pick one probably is just going to pick, I'm probably just gonna pick games here in a bit and stop doing resources. Um, Cause I just might get burnt out, but yeah. Guys, does that make sense? I'm not sure if, if that wheel makes sense, but it's not for everybody, but it's certainly something that it, it reduces risk. It, it definitely reduces risk, so. Um, okay. Let's see here. Is it okay? Gary question. It's harder to get a good publisher if you're not from the U S or UK or Japan. How can we deal with that? Okay. So I'm going to do my best here to answer this without coming across, um, arrogant or closed minded or whatever. Um, I understand. I, I understand that being in America and being fluently an English speaker is a huge, huge asset, okay? So, Garib, I would just say that it's not necessarily being in America or the West that makes it easy to make games or get funding for games. My theory is it's just about being fluent in the English language and the culture associated with it. Um, because then you can pitch things to publishers and they're not going to be like, if I was a publisher, I'd be really worried if there would be a language barrier during development because a publisher is going to be talking to you all like for all day long, every day for six months to a year working on your game. Um, so I know publishers, like I know plenty of publishers who work with plenty of developers where English is their second language, but it is an asset where English is, um, if you're fluent in English and there isn't any sort of confusion or language barrier. And this is coming from somebody who only speaks one language. So I understand that I am in the position of being the most ignorant. Like I don't, I, I don't, I don't speak a second language. So bravo to those of you who um, are working on making English your second language. Cause that's beyond my intelligence. And I'm really, really proud of you. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. George Bush is in the chat, guys. Hey, George. Tell us a little bit more about that war. What was that all about? Can you answer, George? Um, George, I'm so sorry. I know you probably get that all day long. Um, that's crazy. Moyed says, uh, I think I said your name right. Moyed says, English is my fourth language. Um, that's incredible. That's <laughs> Gosh. Uh Um, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't argue like for how many of you in the chat have an accent when you're speaking in English and by accent, I'm not talking like uh, British or American. I'm talking like, um, a French accent or a German accent. How many of you in the chat, give me a raised hand. How many of you have an uh, accent? Let me know in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Eastern European accent. I love Eastern European. Um, so that would, would that be Slavic, a Sl uh, Slavic and, um, Polish is Polish Slavic. Anyway, I went to Slovakia over the summer and I loved it. It was awesome. And I love the Slovak accent. Um, cool. Yeah. So we've got people with accents. I would argue that an accent is your, one of your greatest assets, especially when it comes to YouTube devlogs. Guys, who are the people who do really, really well on YouTube? 
Um, I would say that they're people who are fluent in English, but they have an accent. Danny is one of them. Um, what is what, what, what's Danny's accent, by the way? Does anybody know? Um, I, w I would argue that it's a huge asset, and frankly, I wish I had one. Uh, so, Anyway, um, one more question here. What do you think about games developed in Brazil? I, I think that's great. Um, Brazil is apparently a big game development country. Um, is it Norwegian? Norwegian, okay, or Danish. Envalon says, I'm from Slovakia. That's awesome. Okay, guys. Well, I think that's all I've got time for. Just remember, guys, that, you know, I love you. I value you. And I want to see you guys succeed. Um, you know, I hope these questions were really, really helpful. And by the way, if you're one of my students, feel free to say hello in the chat. And just remember, guys, 14 days left, 100 seats available. It's probably like something like 85 right now to join full-time game dev. Do you have to join my program to be a full-time game developer? No, of course not. But it is going to make it easier for you. And I can imagine people in the chat who are students will say that it makes it significantly easier to understand the path to building your own game studio. So be sure to click that link below to get 50% off to join the program. Or just click the link and just check it out, you know. Anyway, um, guys, I love you so much. Any other questions? Let's see here. Hey, hey, Michael. Michael just joined the course. That's awesome, buddy. Thanks for supporting the channel. Um, and good luck. Good luck on your 2023 journey. Um, that's awesome. All right, I'm making a 2D game prototype while in college and can't figure out with code how to flip the player sprite <laughs> with left and right sprite animation. I would just flip it, I you know, flip the sprite. Um, use the flip X. There's a, it's called, if there's a sprite image component, there's a little checkbox that's flip X. Got any tips for young developers? Uh, yes, um, I would say, um, release crappy games. <laughs> Don't be, I know when I was young, I was very, very insecure. Uh, just release crappy games because yeah. Um, grow a thick skin and don't worry too much about what people think of you. It'll pay off, I promise. All right. <clears throat> yeah, I thought I'd stop too. Um, okay, guys, that's everything. Thanks for hanging out. I'll talk to you later. Cheers. Get over here. Get down. Hey, thanks for watching. By the way, if you haven't downloaded that free 2D game kit below, click below, it's my treat to you. I used this game kit to make a game for PewDiePie in 14 days, and I actually got to play it with him in front of his audience, which was really cool. This game kit is totally free. It's my treat to you, and you can use it however you want. You can make a commercial game and make a million bucks off this game kit. I don't care. Or you could just use it for a hobby project. It's my treat to you. And by the way, if you haven't clicked like, that would mean a ton to me, hit subscribe, and also, this is important, hit that notification bell, here's why. If you get notified of when I'm live, you can watch me make my next game and let me know in the chat what you think about the game or any ideas you have, and you might just show up, your chat might just show up in the next video that I upload. All right, I'll talk to you later, bye.